Now it's a good time to talk about how to check uh, randomness. So we will start with uh, Golomb's randomness postulates, but uh, in order to do that, uh, we need some definitions first. So let's start with the definition of a run. A run in a binary sequence is defined as a set of consecutive zeros or ones. For example, uh, here you can see four zeros. This is a single run and you have uh, six ones here. It is also a run of length six. Uh, another definition is autocorrelation. When you uh, rotate a sequence and then exhort it with itself, then we call it a, uh, its autocorrelation, which is uh, defined like this. So let's A, B the sequence like this. These AIs are zeros or ones. Uh, so it is a binary sequence of length. And autocorrelation CI of A is defined by A XOR to itself, which is rotated I uh, bits to some direction. It actually defines, it depends on how you define the autocorrelation. Finally, let's talk about autocorrelation function. Autocorrelation function theta of a binary sequence is defined as follows. Uh, it is uh, actually XOR itself, which is rotated. Uh, each bit is XOR to tau next to it. So it is uh, like the definition here, autocorrelation here. Tau is a phase shift of sequence of the AN. And theta measures the amount of similarity between the sequence and its phase shift. So here we are performing XOR operation, but this summation operation is actually a, an integer summation. So uh, here you will get an integer, some number between zero to P minus one, but then you will divide it with one over P. So at the end you will get something between zero and one. Uh, we will give uh, some examples in a minute. So now we can talk about pseudo randomness. Only infinite length sequences can be random. We call a finite length sequence pseudo random if it looks random. So here looks uh, actually is not a scientific definition. So we will try to figure out uh, what looks random. So this is why we are going to talk about Golomb's randomness postulates. So these postulates, uh, uh, there are three of them. First one says that Number of ones and zeros should differ by at most by one. So this means that since uh, it is a uniform distribution, uh, the probability of getting a zero or one is pro one over one, sorry, one over two. So the uh, idea is that if you have an infinite length uh, zeros and ones, half of them must be zero and half of them must be one. But uh, since there's an infinite length sequence, it is not, uh, I mean, we are talking about infinity here, but in the finite case, what we are expecting to see is that half of them uh, to be zero or one, but if it is an odd length, then uh, one of them has to be larger than the other one. This is why we say differ by at most one. So if it is an even length uh, sequence, then zeros and ones, number of zeros and ones should be same. If it, the length of the sequence is odd, then one of them should be just uh, larger than the other one by one. Half of the runs should have length one, one fourth of the runs should have length two, one eighth of the runs should have length three, and so on and so forth. So this, this postulate is about the uh, number of runs and their lengths. And finally, autocorrelation function should be two valued. So these are uh, Golomb's postulates. So let's look at an example and understand what it is. So let's say that the sequence is defined as follows, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1. So let's look at first, uh, let's first look at the first postulate. Uh, we look at the number of zeros, it is four. We look at number of ones, it is three. So their difference is one, which is less than or equal to one as the first postulate says. So this sequence satisfies uh, Golomb's first postulate. And let's look at runs. So if we uh, divide it into runs, we have the, this run, this, this, and this. So we have four runs in total. Two of them has length one, one of them has length two, and one of them has length three. So if we divide it to the total number of runs, uh, we get, uh, you know, we have 
uh, four runs, half of them is, should be uh, length one. And you know, one fourth of them should be length two. And one eighth of them should be uh, length three. Of course, four over eight is not an integer, so it's close to one. So this also satisfies the second postulate. So let's look at the third one. Let's calculate the autocorrelation function, C tau. So when tau is zero, uh, C rotated zero bits is the C itself, S itself, sorry. So if you XOR this with S, so S XOR S rotated zero bits is always zero. So you get zero, but the length of the sequence is seven. So actually this number is zero divided by seven, which is zero anyway. So actually this, in this function, this value will always be zero because if you exert something to itself, it will be all zero sequence. So theta will be zero. Uh, so let's look at the second one. Let's rotate this uh, sequence one bit to the left. So this is the value. Now, if you XOR both of them, S with S rotated one to the left, you can see you will get zero, zero, one, 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 zero, one, as written here. So if you look at the weight of this uh, sequence, uh, remember that in the formula we had an integer summation, so the result is four. If you do keep doing the same thing, you will see that uh, all of them are four. And if you divide it with the uh, length of the sequence, you will get, four over seven. So as you can see, we have a function here, which is two valued. The result is either zero or this. So if you never consider the zero rotation, if you look at the remaining parts, we are actually expecting C tau to be single valued. So this also satisfies the third postulate. So these are postulates, but now uh, these are not good enough to be in order to determine something is uh, random or not because for instance if you uh, change this one with zero then it will fail this first postulate but it is uh, not a good thing to say that it is a bad sequence because it doesn't look random so we have to have an error margin somehow because this is a very strong definition saying that uh, number of ones and zeros should differ by at most one. Because if you always apply this situation in all of your random numbers, then when you're, uh, for instance, using an AES key, then I would uh, suspect that half of your bits are zero and half of them are one. Actually, this doesn't enough for me to break the key by an exhaustive search, but at least it reduces the uh, number of possibilities. So how do we test the random? uh, randomness? Various statistical tests can be applied to a sequence to attempt to compare and evaluate the sequence to a truly random sequence. Randomness is a probabilistic property. That is, the properties of a random sequence can be characterized and described in terms of probability. So uh, there are some statistical tests for this. But before going to that, uh, let's look at the entropy source first. So uh, remember that uh, if you go back to our picture here, we're generally dealing with this kind of situation where a cascaded uh, uh, construction is at end. So you have an entropy source. So you have the output of a non-deterministic random numbers here. Then you perform some operation and obtain your random numbers here. So your statistical randomness test should be applied here, but you should also apply some entropy test to here to check if your entropy source is good. So NIST has two documents, one of them for this entropy source and one of them is this for this random uh, statistical randomness test. So we will first look at this one and then move on to the other one. So if you go back to our slides here, let's look at first, uh, uh, NIST recommendation for the entropy sources. This is uh, specified in NIST special publication 800-90B. So this is actually a documentation, but you can implement it yourself and uh, run it as a test suite. So it has some parts. First one is health test. In this case, uh, 
the entropy source is run and you know it is shut down and turn it on again to see if it functions uh, correctly so this health tests are to check if uh, running for a long time causes some malfunction or not then uh, this uh, idea is to check if uh, the device provides uh, the device the bits that are produced by this device uh, satisfy the iid assumption uh, which is independent and identical distributed this iid is short for this so uh, some entry in this uh, document uh, first you have to check if the for instance the device manufacturer claims that their device has iid so if they say that they have this if they have this claim then you have you need to perform some 11 tests and with depending on the result of this test you can say yes this is iid or no it doesn't satisfy this independence and identical distribution properties so if it fails iid assumption or the manufacturer never claims such a, a thing then you perform a mean entropy uh, estimation test which are written here so ideas as follows if the if it does if the device doesn't satisfy iid assumption or it is never claimed that it has iid assumption then these tests are performed and uh, the minimum of these tests are taken as the mean entropy So all of these uh, nine tests are explained in the, this NIST document. So all of them uh, tries to measure the entropy of the system and gives you a number between zero and one. Then the minimum is uh, assumed to be the entropy of this source. Uh, but I think the most recent version of this documentation was published uh, two years ago i think it was in january but just a few months later in at fsc conference it was shown that uh, two of these tests uh, actually were providing uh, values smaller than uh, the real value so since we are performing all of these nine tests and assuming the, the minimum is the uh, correct entropy for this device uh, these two tests were actually causing a problem so they are corrected in that paper and i'm assuming that NIST will also update this document maybe they already done uh, while we are uh, preparing this talk so but this is how it works but other thing is that if uh, we were considering the if case where the iid assumption failed but if this after these 11 tests if iid assumption is correct then what you do is just perform this first test and uh, take the result of that as the entropy of the source. So you don't perform the remaining ones. So this is to check the entropy of the source, but you have to understand something here. So you can always design a system which is a backdoor or, uh, you know, uh, which is a structured entropy source, which would pass all of these tests. So here, uh, NIST not, is not trying to find a backdoor or check if the device has really uh, uh, has an entropy source that is coming from a physical source or anything. As I said before, if you run AES encryption algorithm, uh, AES block cipher in a counter mode and could uh, provide the cipher text to this uh, uh, software, let's say, it will pass all of these tests and the entropy will be close to one. But this, you, so in other words, you can always trick this test. And here the idea is not to find a backdoor. Here we are assuming that uh, you are trying to design and you are honestly trying to design a good entropy source. So you just want to check if there is something wrong with it. So this test can always be uh, you can design a system, a very simple one, which will pass all of these tests with high scores. So let's move on to the second one, which is uh, in its special publication 800-22. This is uh, in its statistical test suite, and the, I think the 
title of the document was a statistical test suite for random and pseudo random number generators for cryptographic applications. So this document provides 11, uh, sorry, 15 tests. And sometimes uh, some of them uh, are retracted. So I don't know if uh, all of them are still valid. Maybe one of them is still retracted. We, I don't know. You need to check because sometimes some tests are uh, defined in a wrong way. So all of these tests uh, try to check a different property of the uh, uh, random numbers and uh, give you a result between zero and one. And you have to choose your p-value here. So uh, p-value threshold here. So uh, for instance, uh, the frequency test uh, looks at the numbers of zeros and ones and look at the difference between these numbers and see, try to figure out if it is a, a reasonable amount or if it is really huge. In order to do that, you have to define your threshold. For instance, if you uh, choose your threshold one over a thousand, this means that among all of the sequences of length n, uh, one uh, one over thousand of them would fail this test. So you are trying to eliminate the bad ones. But of course, if you choose your threshold something higher, like one over a hundred, then you will eliminate every a hundred uh, sequence here. So if your sequence fails some of your, these tests, then you would be suspicious. But if it is, if it pass all of them in most of the time, then you will say that your random number generator kind of acts in a good way. So uh, there are other tests, the statistical test suits too. For instance, CryptX uh, has eight tests, DieHard has 15 tests, DieHarder has six, 26 tests, TestU01 has 18 tests. In Middle East Technical University, we had a uh, statistical test suite that we call SADIST. And uh, during many years, many different research groups actually work on it. So there are many variants. Uh, in some of them, we have even more than 30 tests. But having more tests doesn't mean that it is better. Some of the tests might become redundant after you add a few tests because maybe they are always eliminating the similar sequences like which are eliminated by other tests too and so on but uh, it is an area that uh, still many things can be done and uh, people don't pay much attention to this area but in cryptography we really need randomness and these entropy source test suits and statistical test suits are really uh, useful to check if your system is functioning in a correct way. 